with the siege of Alexandria concluded, and Cleopatra situated firmly on Egypt's throne as his vassal, Caesar decided his presence was required in other parts of the empire. In Africa, Marcus Porcius Cato, Metellus Scipio, and Titus Labienus were successfully rebuilding the Pompeian legions. In Hispania, Quintus Cassius Longinus, to whom Caesar had given the governorship of Hispania Ulteria, was facing Pompeian uprisings. Turning to Africa for assistance, Quintus Cassius dragged King Bogard of Mauritania into the conflict. In Illyricum, uprisings continued as a consequence of a Pompeian commander named Marcus Octavius having settled in the area following the Battle of Pharsalus. Although Romans living in Illyricum supported Caesar, the local Illyrians still believed in the Pompeian cause. Allying himself with the locals, Marcus Octavius led a number of attacks, assailing garrisons and raiding towns. In Rome, Marcus Antonius had lost control of the government. With the urban poor occupying the Forum Romanum under the influence of Dolabella, violence and anarchy once again reigned supreme within the city. Despite the urgent crises afoot in Africa, Hispania, Illyricum, and Rome, it was paramount that Caesar immediately address the recent conquests of King Pharnaces, who was threatening to strip Rome of her eastern provinces, as well as her client kingdoms. Already Pharnaces had defeated Caesar's legate, Nius Domitius Calvinus, at the Battle of Nicopolis. Deceiving Calvinus with ongoing dispatches feigning a desire to reach an amicable resolution and avoid bloodshed, Pharnaces lured Calvinus to the town of Nicopolis, where Calvinus set up camp. With the newly created 35th, 36th, and 37th legions, comprised of former Pompeian soldiers, Nius Domitius Calvinus augmented his army with a hastily raised Pontic legion, and two auxiliary legions from King Diotarus of Galatia. Through his mother, the Galatian princess, Adobogina the Younger, King Diotarus was the nephew of Caesar's ally, King Mithridates of Pergamon. King Diotarus, having already lost portions of his kingdom to Pharnaces, rushed straight to Calvinus to create an alliance. King Ariobarzanes III, who was the grandson of the King Ariobarzanes placed on Cappadocia's throne by Lucius Cornelius Sulla, also donated 10,000 legions to Calvinus in his own attempts to keep Pharnaces from taking his kingdom. The city of Nicopolis sat in a valley, protected on both sides by mountains. Because to attack the city outright would make his legions vulnerable to ambush, Calvinus marched closer to the city, and then set up camp. As his men were building camp, Pharnaces ordered his legions out of the city, where the plains would be more friendly to his Scythian chariots, otherwise useless within the walls of Nicopolis. Calvinus finished his camp, and pulled his troops within. It was at this time that Caesar's request for military aid, which had been intercepted by Pharnaces, was allowed to pass to Calvinus. Without all his legions, Calvinus could not hope to take Pharnaces, yet to ignore Caesar's request might compromise the dictator in Alexandria. Choosing to support Caesar, Calvinus released the 35th and 37th legions, keeping the 36th, along with his Galatian, Pontic, and Cappadocian auxiliaries. In order to strengthen his position, Pharnaces ordered two trenches be dug alongside his infantry. These trenches, which enclosed his infantry and protected their flanks, stretched from the front of his lines to the town walls. Pharnaces then placed his cavalry outside the trenches. Calvinus formed his lines, placing Diotarus's infantry legions at his centre, his newly created Pontic legion on his left, and his 36th legion on his right, with Ariobarzani's legions held in reserve. When Calvinus called out the order, and his army charged, only his 36th legion on the right made progress, successfully pushing Pharnaces' cavalry back toward the city. But the Pontic legions on Calvinus's left flank did not enjoy the same level of success. As Calvinus's 35th legion turned, crossing the trenches, and attacking Pharnaces' infantry from the side, Pharnaces' infantry along the other trench crossed over and began threatening Calvinus's Pontic legions. As the Pontic legions began to crumble, Diotarus's legions, in the centre, also wavered and retreated, leaving the 36th legion and Calvinus himself, hemmed in by the forces of Pharnaces. Forming a protective circle around their commander, the 36th legion was forced to cut itself free from the enemy, 
and make its way to the nearby mountains. With the loss of Nicopolis, due in no small part to surrendering two full legions to Caesar at his request, Nius Domitius Calvinus was forced to withdraw to Anatolia, having lost upwards of 6,000 men at the Battle of Nicopolis. Pharnaces, spurred on by his victory at Nicopolis, stormed Roman towns as he tried to reclaim the territories that once belonged to his father. Roman citizens were executed, along with local men who were of fighting age, and all the young boys were castrated on the orders of King Pharnaces. Unfortunately for Pharnaces, he was unable to solidify his new conquest, as his son-in-law, Asander, sought to take over the Bosporus in Pharnaces' absence. This forced Pharnaces to turn his armies around and march them towards the Bosporus to deal with the uprising. However, as Pharnaces marched away from Anatolia, Caesar, having successfully concluded his war in Alexandria, thanks to the additional troops sent to him by Calvinus, was now marching his armies towards Anatolia. Reaching Pontus by the end of July of the 47 BC year, Caesar combined his 35th and 37th legions with what remained of Calvinus's 36th and the auxiliary legions of King Diotarus, and began marching towards the Bosporus. Pharnaces, halfway home, was forced to turn again and march back towards Anatolia in order to confront Caesar. As both armies approached the town of Zella, Pharnaces, as he had done to Calvinus, sent dispatches en route proclaiming his desire to settle things amicably, which Pharnaces hoped Caesar would accept as he knew Caesar was desperately needed in Rome. Caesar declared his willingness to forgive, provided Pharnaces surrender to the rightful owners all the land and gold he had taken, and then surrender himself as well. Although Pharnaces initially agreed to Caesar's terms, when the Bosporan king made no immediate move to withdraw his troops, Caesar quickly marched his forces to take on Pharnaces, who had camped at the town of Zella. Camped on the high ground, Pharnaces was able to continue receiving his incoming supplies from the town of Zella by an attached road. Caesar, arriving with his forces, set up camp on the high ground opposite Pharnaces. With a valley between him and no way to interrupt Pharnaces' supply line, Caesar anticipated a long standoff between the two armies. As Caesar's men began erecting their camp, however, Pharnaces unexpectedly marched his men into battle lines. We are told by Caesar that this move baffled him, as there was a valley between the two camps, and a direct attack by either side would mean an uphill battle, which was never an advantage. Confident that Pharnaces was bluffing, Caesar ordered his legions to continue with camp preparations, but commanded one line of infantry to protect the workers. But Pharnaces was not bluffing. He ordered his men to march, and as they began ascending the hill towards his camp, Caesar is said to have laughed at such a ridiculous tactic. When Pharnaces' legions fell on Caesar's single line of infantry, the remainder of Caesar's men were still building camp, forcing Caesar to hastily call his men into combat. Before Caesar's men arrived to reinforce the protective infantry, Pharnaces' Scythian chariots broke through, and began attacking Caesar's line from behind. As the camp builders arrived to fortify the battle lines, they attacked Pharnaces' chariots with Pilum and other missiles, forcing the Scythian chariots to retreat. In brutal and bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat, the battle between Caesar and Pharnaces raged until finally Caesar's right flank began to gain ground, forcing Pharnaces' men back down the slope. Then came the support of the 36th Legion on the left and the remainder of Caesar's forces in the centre, continuing to pressure men back down the hill. Giving up, Pharnaces' men broke ranks and began to run, trampled and crushed by those also trying to escape Caesar's legions. At the Battle of Zella, only five days after arriving in Pontus, Caesar's forces were victorious against the army of King Pharnaces in a single day. Though Pharnaces fled, heading back to the Bosporus, the majority of his legions were cut down by Caesar's men. Caesar wrote to notify the Senate of his victory over Pharnaces at the Battle of Zella. In his dispatch to the Senate, Caesar wondered that it had taken Pompeius Magnus so many years to pacify the East when it was made up of tacticians such as Pharnaces. In this dispatch to the Senate, the historian, Appian, attributes the following phrase to Caesar, Veni, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, and, I conquered.